This is the official first podcast, and I have a super special guest, personal friend. He has taught me so much about business, about scaling. This is Ian McCarthy. Where do you live? Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Okay, and what do you do? We want to know. People <laughs> want to know, what does Ian do? I'm a landscape contractor, mm -hmm. and landscaping has brought us into other businesses such as pool construction and tennis and sport court construction as well. When did you actually start doing landscaping? How old were you? What year was it? I was 26 years old. Yeah. This is way back in 1996. Uh -huh. And um, I was an accountant and I bought my client who was a small gardening company on the island mowing gardening. And I bought him in March of 96. And I didn't know anything about landscaping, but that's actually how I got into the industry. Mm -hmm. What was it like getting into an industry that you knew nothing about? Well, I knew about accounting, which was very helpful in, in any business venture. But to illustrate my situation, mm -hmm. the first day of the of the spring season, the crew asked me to go get the mulch. So I, I mean, I kind of knew mulch goes in the beds, but I didn't really know a lot about it. So I went to the nursery with my Nissan Maxima car, asked for mulch, and they saw my car and they realized I wasn't going to get a loader full. Did they think you were a homeowner? Probably. Yeah. yeah. And so they, um, they pointed me to these bags of pine nugget mulch, like the big chunky nuggets, which is not normally what we use. So I brought the whole car load out to the crew and they looked at me like I had three heads and then they had a laugh. And then they're like, no, you're supposed to get the dump truck first and then get the bulk shredded mulch. Mm -hmm. So that was just like one of many things that happened where I was like, I don't know anything about this business, but I was able to do the billing and I started to learn the estimating. And initially it was maintenance, but we started to get drawn into construction more and more. So you got into the business 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. I'm 33. So I was literally three years old. Mm -hmm. I was in diapers running around screaming when you were getting your first bag of mulch. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it like starting a business or buying a business, getting into business 30 years ago? Well, I think now there's advantages with obviously social media and online and computerization. Um, in those days, we used to spend all weekend printing invoices, stuffing envelopes, licking envelopes, licking stamps. Of course, now you can fire things out, you know, Boom. push of a button. But I think back then, too, being on an island, you know, it wasn't as wealthy as it is now, but it was still a summer, you know, destination. It was uh, less of a learning curve than if I was like in the middle of Chicago because mm -hmm. competition was limited and travel time was limited and customers were appreciative that they had someone that was providing service. And we had repeat employees, but I think there's advantages and disadvantages both ways. So based on all that, 30 years ago, when you wanted to learn a subject on how to do pavers, how to do plants, how to do something, you couldn't just fire off in Google. Right. And you had to literally go to the library. Yeah, no probably, YouTube. Right? No YouTube. No YouTube. But um, I got a VHS tape. You know what that is? Yeah, I got I one know. of those in the mail, and it was called Clip Software. Uh -huh. It was a demo, and it was a routing, scheduling, billing software. And I thought, well, this is really cool. And so I bought the software for our company. But every year they had an annual conference in Maryland. So all the users would get together and they would bring in industry people like Tony Bass and Marty Grunder and these different people that are now consultants. And so that's where we would learn because you would not only hear people speak. Seminars. 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 You hear people speak, but you also would meet other contractors mm -hmm. and you'd have lunch with them and they'd ask what you do and, and vice versa. A lot of them were jealous that I had accounting background. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, tell me how you plant all these trees quickly, <laughs> you know, like yeah. techniques in the field. So that was probably the place to learn. So going, going to all these uh, seminars and pretty much masterminds, yeah. was that did that give you a big boost when you first started? Absolutely, because I'm leaving a tiny island. I'm going to a big city somewhere. I'm learning all these things that people are doing around the country. Mm -hmm. and now I can apply them on the island. And a lot of people, a lot of people are probably wondering, you know, they, they want to get into start doing construction and stuff like this. Wouldn't it be easier for you to go find someone that you can hire in that already has all that experience versus you learning everything from square one right and what I did is I hired the people that spoke at these conferences to come to my business as a consultant and I wanted to learn everything they could they could teach me so I definitely took use of consultants in the industry and that helped me jump levels I guess in those days yeah and all people want is money right that's that's the easiest hack if you pay right you get a lot of information and people sometimes they don't want to pay how much money did you spend in your education when you first started I probably spent over a hundred thousand on consultants in about a five-year period. Crazy. Yeah. Looking back, 
Do you regret spending that hundred thousand? Absolutely not. <laughs> Best money I ever spent. <laughs> <laughs> See, even even for stuff, even when you get a course or something, you bring a consultant in and it didn't work as well as you thought, you still learned something. Right. You know what I mean? And that's what people uh, are afraid to do because you pulled the trigger, you believed in yourself, you invest in yourself, and then later on, right now, thirty years later, ten million dollar business, and right now the boys are working for you, right. and you're here, right, in San Jose. Yep. all the way from the East Coast, which is very inspiring and crazy. But this is how businesses should be run. Right. You know, for the longest time you did maintenance. Right. How did you venture into doing construction and pavers and concrete and stuff like that? Well, uh, in the first few years, people would ask for something small, a driveway, a patio. And this was above our skill set at the time. But I had a mason from Scotland who had sent us a package in the mail. Scotland. Scotland. Wow. He was living in Nantucket. And so I brought him into the office. We met with him. He explained that he wanted to have kind of a symbiotic subcontractor relationship. So we started marketing his company as being a division of our company. Mm -hmm. And then his crew and with his oversight would do the hardscaping under us. But I was still writing all the proposals and I would have to sit with him for hours and get the step-by-step -step information. So that was how I started to learn the process behind construction. Because you don't want to make too many mistakes. No, and this way he would give us a fixed price for labor. We'd mark it up. Ah. We'd mark up the materials so we couldn't lose, and he had to get the job done. And he's been doing this for probably all his life. Yeah, I mean, he would build OG. castles and stuff in <laughs> Scotland. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, having him on your team, did that eventually take you to the next level? Did you scale your business? Yeah, so what happened is, is I got married. My wife was from the mainland, Cape Cod. And so I started spending more time over there, and I realized that the properties, the homes, the lots were bigger, projects were bigger. Um, on Nantucket, we bid on a project for the race car driver, Roger Penske. Oh, yeah, okay. So that was a learning curve because that was a seven-figure project in probably 98. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get the project, but the company that did was from the Cape. And so I became like stalkerish mm -hmm. obsessed with that company yeah. because they were doing high-end stonework everywhere. And so Are they I would, still around? Yeah. Okay. I compete against them now. Wow. Yeah. But I would drive around looking at their sites and try to figure out how do they get those jobs. And so I ended up buying another company on the Cape in 2001, which mm -hmm. was a maintenance company. But that allowed me to establish two different branches and then started to bring in workers from the H2B program to help scale the labor. Mm -hmm. And then soon we were doing construction maintenance on both Cape Cod and Nantucket. So it seems like you were obsessed. I was driven. Yeah. Entrepreneurial. And driven. that's that's what people don't realize is you have to have that obsession because you're stalking people's job sites just to right. figure stuff out. Right. That's awesome. So now you're doing construction on the Cape. How did that go? What happened? Well, we had H2B workers, yeah. right? So when they're here, you got to give them work. And we were hustling builders. We were putting out flyers. We had a thing called the Yellow Pages back then. But sometimes we'd have valleys where we didn't have as much work as we wanted. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out a way that we could have a consistent flow of construction work. And one day I get a call from a gentleman who wanted to meet me and so I took the meeting, didn't really know what it was about, but he explained that he was a business developer. I said, mm, what, what does that mean? He right. said, well, it, some people would say sales, but he goes, I don't consider it sales because I have relationships with landscape architects and designers all around New England for 25 years. And if I was to join your company, they would entrust us together with, uh, with their projects. And so I took him at the opportunity, hired him, and so now we set up this guy to go around and market to architects and high-end builders. And we started getting the projects that that company that I was stalking were getting. And we started bidding against them. It was kind of like a secret way into the, the club that you couldn't get in if you were just on the street and didn't know how to do it. That's awesome. So you got in. Yep. And then what happened? So we landed a $1.5 million dollar landscape and hardscape for a private tennis club in Nantucket. That was probably the peak of my career in that first company. How old were you then? I was 32. And what did, uh, so you've been in this for six years already? Yes. Okay. And got on the cover of Lawn and Landscape Magazine, was starting to get known around Cape Cod for being a good sized company. Um, and so we kept going at that. We kept doing other architect projects. Things were getting elevated. And then I sold the company. Wow. Why? Well, I got an opportunity to invest in a minor league basketball team, uh -huh. and I grew up playing basketball. I'm from Washington, D.C. originally, so it was kind of a hobby, 
wife calls it a midlife crisis. <laughs> but it was something fun to do because I just spent yeah. seven, eight years burnt out, you know, working 80, 90 hours a week, all, <clears throat> all business all the time. So I thought, you know what, this would be a good, you know, fun thing on the weekend, go with the team on road trips and things like that. What happened was, is after the first year, we realized that Cape Cod was not a great place to have a professional basketball team because all we had was high schools. Mm. So I had some partners, investors in the team, and we decided to relocate to Manchester, New Hampshire, so we could have a more professional venue. Mm -hmm. And then, how much did you sell the business for? Well, I sold it off in pieces. So a previous uh, employee of mine was running a maintenance company on the island. So I sold all the maintenance accounts to him. Mm -hmm. Then on the Cape, I had a maintenance manager, a full-time employee currently. I transitioned the company to him. Mm -hmm. So basically, we came up with lists of equipment and then a percentage of sales. And looking back, I probably, if I wanted to just sit back and get the highest dollar, could have done a lot better. But I wanted to sell it because I wanted to go to New Hampshire with right. the team. Right. Um, and then the one good thing that came out of it was I got a kicker from the guy on the island that if I referred him to construction, I would get 5%. So I ended up hooking him up with a couple of my architects, and he did a couple million dollars in the next few years with That's them. So offer. I was getting residual payments. That's amazing. Um, so now I'm living in New Hampshire, yeah. running a professional basketball team for three years. And one of the owners of a team in Canada called me up one day and said, uh, our title sponsor would like a team in this city in Canada. If you move there, they'll give you $200,000 a year. So, was that a lot of money at the time? Yeah, for a, for a sponsorship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you ha might have sponsorships that are twenty five hundred or five grand. You know, mm -hmm. you get a banner and some tickets and things like that. So th this was definitely a big time sponsorship, and um, the the city was three hours east of Maine, mm -hmm. so it wasn't that far. And they had a six thousand seat arena, so packed up the family and my partners and. Phew. What did your wife say about all this? Because at the time you were married with children. Right. Was she supportive of the basketball dream? She was. Um, she was. I would say she was definitely supportive. My sons didn't want to go because they had friends, ah. and they were like 12 and 8. And the first week we brought them to the city, the um, arena offered us the luxury suite for a hockey game. So I brought up the family to check out the arena, and we're sitting in the suite, and they have, like, complimentary food, chicken wings and pizza and sodas and everything. So my boys are sitting in the, you know, the box will hold like 20 people, but yeah. we're only like five people. So they're sitting there eating chicken wings. And my oldest son looks to my younger son and goes, hey, Connor, it's like we're princes. <laughs> so they started to get the vision that like, hey, this is something kind of cool yeah. that my dad has a professional team and, and we'll get some perks out of it. So then they kind of went along with the program. Yeah, they, they supported it. And yeah. then what made you get out of basketball? And then obviously now you're in landscaping. Right. So that evolved into me starting the National Basketball League mm -hmm. of Canada with a couple of the other owners. And we did that for five years. And then my wife got pregnant with our daughter. And if you've heard about the Canadian health care, that was number three. Yeah. Um, they didn't want to give her, they didn't want to finance her having a C-section. And she'd already had two. Ah. So she said, I'm not comfortable having the baby in Canada. I'm going to have the baby back in the U.S. Good old America. Good old USA yeah. doctors. Yeah. So she had always went to the Cape anyway in the summer to see family. So that summer, 2014, she started seeing the doctor down there. So fast forward to the fall. My daughter's born. My older son's getting ready to go to college in the States, in Massachusetts. So it just it wasn't a situation where they were just going to move right back. So now I'm stuck because I'm chief operating officer of a league and I'm GM and president of the team and I'm over here but they're here mm -hmm. so I'm kind of like I'm in the military I'm gone for a month or two come back for a couple of days and seeing this little baby grow I was like this is not sustainable mm -hmm. so I gave notice and resigned from sports and found myself back on the Cape Wow so how old was your how old are your two boys when you decided to leave when I decided to leave the yeah, basketball, basketball. Yeah. Um, my oldest son was uh, 17, younger son was 13. Well, that's a big, that's a big uh, age gap between yeah. kids. Yeah. That's crazy. And well, and my daughter was like one. Right. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So now, now that you had moved back to the Cape, how'd you get back into landscaping? So when I got back to the Cape, I had no plans. I hadn't started a business. I hadn't gotten a job. I was just decompressing after 10 years away. You know. Uh, spending a lot of time with the baby, new baby. But in the afternoon, I would go crabbing just because it was a hobby of mine. 
So I'm going crabbing. I'm posting these pictures on Facebook of catching crabs, cooking them up, steaming them. Yep. Remember, I'm from yep. D.C., Maryland. Yep. Yep. And so a friend of mine, Bob Maffey, who's a land, well-known landscaper from the Cape, he says, hey, I want to go crabbing with you. I didn't even know there were crabs here. So I invited him to go crabbing. So we're out there crabbing. And he kept saying, E, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? You know, we could use some help at the, at the company. We need some management help. Why don't you come in and talk about it? Mm -hmm. So I'd been home about six months, and uh, I said, all right, I'll go listen to him. Were you just chilling for six months? Chilling. Just living just, it up. Yeah, sleeping until 9.30, <laughs> taking care of the baby, yeah. take a nap with the baby, yeah. go crabbing, stay up late, watch what TV, whatever. Okay. Nothing else. So then you went into his office. <laughs> so I went into his office. And I was surprised to find out that he was doing $11 million in sales with and one construction crew. The wow. rest was all maintenance. Whoa. So I thought to myself, well, I could help him because I could grow a construction division. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, certainly I had like 50 employees at one point. And so five I- Five zero? Five zero. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So I made a pitch to him like, why don't you hire me to run your construction division and I can do my thing and then you reward me accordingly. So he made an offer. I accepted, joined the construction division October 2016. Mm. And then <coughs> what happened that first year? So the first year, um, he sold to private equity. Oh. <laughs> With it before the first year was up. He did. So he already had a plan to sell the company. Uh -huh. And um, during the year, he wasn't really letting me change too many things. It was kind of like stick to the program, yeah. which hindsight now I understand why. Right. But um, during, it kind of brought my mind back into landscaping. And in the middle of the winter, I had a reunion of all my former employees from my first company that were in the area. So they all came to my house and I thought we we're just getting together, but they're saying, boss, are you bringing us here because you're gonna start the company again? Let's get it together, let's do it. So it seems like your old employees that you uh, left yes. actually liked you. Yeah, they did. Wow, so y employees can actually like an employer. They can. So you must have been a good dude, paid him well, treated him good. Yeah. That's a lot of them were uh, H2B people from other countries. So uh -huh. they looked at me like, you got me here to the country, so I, I'm loyal to you. What countries were they from? Uh, Jamaica and Mexico, predominantly. Wow, that's yeah. cool. Okay, so how did it go with the, the meetup? So the meetup was great. I mean, I wasn't planning on starting a company at that point, but they kept encouraging me. Then afterwards, they would text me pictures. Look at this wall we just did. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot better than when you used to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm starting to think like I got something here because everyone complains that they can't find skilled help. And I have all these guys begging to come to work for me pretty mm -hmm. much. Um, so when I found out that he was selling the company, I basically left and I started building a plan to start a company. Coming up with a name, the crabbing thing kept hanging in my mind. And that's how I came to be Blue Claw Associates. Mm -hmm. How did the transition go from when he sold the company to you leaving? What happened? So I was still there when the transition went through to the new company. Yeah. And and was the was the owner still an owner? Like, what, did he still have to work in the business? He was he was still the CEO, ah. but the private equity company owned the company. Cool. And but he I already gave him give him my notice. So I had a couple months left, and then I was done. Mm -hmm. So I started working on like a website and business plan, and I was finding project pictures of my old projects. Um, because I needed portfolio of some kind to sure. get started. So that winter, it was like uh, 2017, November to March, is just all the pre-planning and preparation. Sent out mailings to architects, sent out LinkedIn messages, any you know phone calls, and that's how I was trying to drum up the work to get mm -hmm. the company started. Mm -hmm. And then you finally did it. I kind of failed in the beginning okay. because I had three bids that I was able to get opportunities on. Yep. Two with a builder that I worked for previously. One was a new designer. And I figured, you know what? I'm going to get one of these three. So I committed to hiring the first two employees. And because I didn't want to hire the employees, I have nothing for them to do. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I was like, this is a reasonable gamble because I have three projects. I can price them competitively, make sure I get one of them. So I bid one. And he said, oh, you didn't get it. Then too bid, high? Yep, yeah. too high. Okay. Then I bid the second one. Oh, how, much, how much was the first one? Do you remember? It was like 65000 Okay. Hardscape. Next and what's the biggest job you've ever done prior to that? Was the $1.5 million tennis oh. club. <laughs> yeah. So the second one, I guess they went with a company that was maintaining the property or whatever. So I'm like, all right, 
it was um, like March, end of March, almost April, we're starting April 15th. All right, I'm going to get this one. Mm -hmm. He told me, looks good. Last minute, didn't get it. Ah, and so, and with, with your area, the, the area you live in, spring is very important. Right. Because if you have a really bad start to a spring, you're going to have a bad year. Right. So you knew spring is time. It's time to crank. Exactly. So now I'm like, I have a couple weeks before the employees were expecting to start work. I don't have a job for them. And how many guys are expecting to come? Two. Two. I was being safe. Okay. You know what I mean? So um, my parents had hired the comp Bob Matthews company to do a landscape design for a new front entrance with a wall and a walkway and all this yeah. stuff. And I told them, don't hire him because I'm leaving. That was previous fall. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to keep this job as a filler. A backup. Yeah. Nice. So now the backup became the first project. Mm -hmm. your, your, uh, your, what is it called? Power base? Yeah. Yeah. Your power base was your first project. Yeah, well, it was my parents' project. Yeah. So I called them up and I said, we're starting April 15th. So I literally started Blue Claw with a job at my parents' house. That's awesome. <laughs> we How had, big was that job? Uh, it, and, well, the first phase was like 40. Uh -huh. You know, Bob was charging them like 60 and I discounted it. It's my parents, parents, right? Yeah, yeah. And then they added on plant things and stuff like that later. But when we started, I had one pickup truck that I drove, a Chevy 1500. We had no trailer. We had no equipment. Mm -hmm. I bought hand tools at Home Depot, kept them under my parents' deck mm -hmm. at night. The employees would drive to the site, meet me there in the morning. Then I'd go get them whatever they need. Wow. Um, we rented Bobcat when we needed it. We rented a mixer, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But I started to get a few other projects while we were on that project, Yeah. such as a bocce court or a little planting or something. So we would dip up out on my parents like see you later I got to go do this because I'm trying to extend their of course work season and so then it became word of mouth one project led to another to another mm -hmm. then finally I did get a project with an architect a small one and so that whole first year was two employees word of mouth job to job and you were driver salesman project Every, manager yeah. uh, emails there's nobody everything. else it was me yeah and I was never a landscaper personally so it wasn't like I'm gonna jump in mm -hmm. and like do the work with them you know i would unload bags of cement and yeah. i would dig or yeah. whatever i got to do but I, i'm not skilled enough in the actual field to take over the job myself which, which actually ended up helping you in the long run because a lot of people what they do is when they don't have someone to do pavers they'll jump in and start doing the pavers. right but you i don't know, have the choice you you didn't know how to do it <clears throat> and neither do i right it was easier to go find someone exactly okay so what happened your second year so i was still reaching out to architects while the guys were working and i got an opportunity with a prominent landscape architect on the Cape for a project in Nantucket. And I bid the project and I scored it. And the base bid was 560. Mm. And so this was the, you know, this is double our first year revenue. And it was starting in January of 2019. And some of the employees that had come to my cookout were laid off. So they came to work for me in the winter. Mm -hmm. And the first couple of days they were just wearing the shirts from their current company yeah and so then when I heard the architect was coming to the island for like an inspection to see us for the first time I made sure that I brought over blue clog gear do you still know the architect today oh yeah she's our biggest client <laughs> yeah yeah so she knows the whole story now she knows the whole story mm -hmm. now yeah that's funny so anyway they um they were impressive to her uh, my project manager actually knew her from another company that he worked for and so that project ended up being 1.8 million dollars over the next two years mm -hmm. We're using all this social media from these projects to spread the word and get other architect clients on board. And that's what really helped us scale the company was being able to have a multitude of architects that were always sending us projects at different times. Wow. So that really worked out for you. Yes. And the architect game really took you to the next level. Yes. Yeah. And that, everything that I learned, I learned from Peter Cook, the guy that I hired in my old company. Mm -hmm. And I let him do all that for me then, but I r didn't realize I was absorbing his knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then when I had to do it myself, I found myself saying things that he would say. Mm. So it's kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi yeah. to Luke Skywalker yeah. imparting the knowledge. Yeah. You know, the, so that was that scale. But then I also knew that these type of clients, you know, you're doing a six figure, seven figure project. Mm -hmm. They want you to take care of it. So I started building a plan to maintain these properties. Yeah. And that's where we decided to bring in the, all the electric equipment. So, and everybody knows that uh, I'm against maintenance, but also I live in California. Right. And you see all these places. Do you think this would be a good place to do maintenance? The houses are very small. Your, yeah. your area, Nantucket, the homeowner has acres. And they don't live there, so they need right. someone to take care of it while they're right. not there. 
Um, I, the the, uh, the best service and maintenance, in my opinion, is horticultural care, the mm -hmm. gardening. You know, that's the relationship with the gardener, the owner. If they want flowers, they want Plants, annuals. Plants, perennials, yeah. annuals, yeah. That's cool. So in 2019, what was what was the sales of your business? How many people did you have, and what did you actually do? Did you do construction, maintenance, pools, fences? What did you do? So in 2019, we had... Uh, we did 2.5 million mm. and it was it was majority landscape construction and we started to get projects from architects that included pools so we would sub out we subbed out i think four pools that year so we would hire a pool company to actually do the pool and then 2020 we had problems with subs because they were not responsive or they would tell you they're coming and they don't come like most subs we get the brunt of the heat from the client right so I have a mason who was like offering to finish the pool while he's working on the stonework. He said, boss, you want me to do that? And I was like, how do you know how to do that? He said, I build pools for 10 years. Mm. So I said, yeah. So I fired the pool company, had him finish the pool. And I said, guess what? We're starting our own pool company because I don't want to be, you know, prisoner of these pool companies anymore. I want to just control start to finish the process. So yeah. we started Blue Water Pools and Spas in 2021. So the sub game didn't really work out for you. And a lot of people, they message me and they say, T, just do subs. Employees are a nightmare. You still have to deal with employees with your subs. Well, I wouldn't say the sub game didn't work, but the subbing of the pool game was a hassle. Right. But we still sub irrigation, fences, you know, mm -hmm. hydro seed, other things like that. Um, but for us, the pool was such a barrier to finishing the project because that drives a lot of the other schedule if you don't have a sub that's doing that productively mm -hmm. it can hold everything up yeah because the pool has to go in first and then the coping and then right. that sets up that's at the whole level for the project right and if he's not doing his job then it's holding everything up yeah so the guy that you hired that finished the pool yeah he got you into the game and he got you a lot of confidence right how did you scale the pool business well, because we created another company, a sister company, it's owned by Blue Claw, but it has a perception of expertise. So we're not Johnny's Landscaping and we build pools. Mm -hmm. We're Blue Claw Associates Landscaping Company and Blue Water Pools and Spas is a pool company. Mm -hmm. So that separate branding, even though it's related, yeah. kind of sets it apart as an expert mm -hmm. in, in the perception of the community. So then we we're able to market that for pools. Almost every, every pool is going to come with a landscape, hardscape, right. coping, so then that feeds projects to Blue Claw. So going into pools, did you have to make a lot of mistakes to get to where you're at today? What happened? Definitely a learning curve. Yeah. Um, and as you know, anything with concrete, gunite, can be a painful learning curve, yes. right? But Very expensive. Yes. But the <laughs> first um, fall that we went into it, I did go to the Genesis Pool School in mm -hmm. Dallas because I wanted to learn everything. Now, Adam, I'm not the guy that's going to build the pool, but I want to understand the process. The theory. So the theory. Yeah. Principles behind it. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, we were going to sub Gunite, we were going to sub Pebble. Can't get any subs in our area. They're all booked out for two years. They're loyal to their existing whatever. So we bought a Gunite rake. We started doing our own Gunite. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing our own Pebble. Mm -hmm. So the more of the process we can control schedule-wise and in-house, the better we feel that it's going to be. So the better it is. And pools are a marketing tool, mm -hmm. right? So people will want a pool, but they're not thinking about the landscaping. But right. once they realize they are getting a pool and they might have a grade change, they need retaining walls, they need a patio, they need a, now I want an outdoor kitchen. So it's a marketing for landscaping. Yeah, and what is it, what does an average pool cost, gunite? In our area it's between 150 and 300,000. Wow, and what's the, how much was the very first pool you did? I think the base was 90, but there was options on it. So probably like 140. Wow. You know, that was 2021. 20, and that's when you first started? That's when we first started. The very yeah. first one. And in our area pools take about six months to complete. Yeah. Are permits a nightmare? What what is what is the uh, what is the worst thing about pools? Well, the first the first few we were handed the permit by the homeowner or by the builder. Um, since then, we got our HIC license, so we can pull our own permits. Mm -hmm. It's very easy in Massachusetts. You don't even have to be a licensed pool contractor. Wow. Or landscaper in wow. our state. No so license. No license. Wow. So I mean, you need a licensed electrician to do that part yes. and get inspection and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just say that. If you don't have guys that know everything about the pool or the tasks that they're on, you can go way over on hours mm -hmm. or you can have to redo things. And we had a situation where we had one guy who could do it really well and we had five or six other guys that had to follow his lead and learn. Mm -hmm. So I was willing to take some of the hits early so that they could get better, get better, get better, get better. Now they're pretty good at it. Yeah. So. What was the most expensive uh, learning lesson that you've ever had with a pool? Well, it was with a pool that we didn't actually install, but we did the stonework on the pool. Mm -hmm. And that um, 
uh, project had a waterfall and the tiles were actually leaching um, a white substance and like an effervescence and the tiles were starting to pop off. And so the pool company ha blamed us for the joint that sat under the coping stone. So they threw you under the bus. They threw me under the bus. I, I went to a bunch of pool people in the industry and they all said it was because the pool wall wasn't waterproofed mm -hmm. on the inside because this is above ground, like it's sticking yeah. up with the waterfall. So I went back and forth, back and forth. The owner spent 90 grand to rectify it with another contractor, wanted reimbursement. Um, it was tied to contractors that we do other work for. So, so the owner fixed the problem? The owner went and got the pr problem fixed. Who did he hire? So he hired someone that was recommended to him on the island. Mm. Yeah. What did the guy say that was the problem? Well, the guy was basically just replacing the tile with stone veneer, uh -huh. and replacing the coping, uh -huh. and they were using waterproof mortar. Ah. So to this day, I don't know if it was our joint or the wall. I probably think it might have been both. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I didn't do the pool, so I feel like the pool company, if there should have been some other kind of material in the joint, they should have been telling me because it's their pool to protect. Yeah. But that's a lesson I've taken into our pool building because that's a huge liability. Did you have to write the check for that? We turned it over to our insurance company. And they wrote the check? Yeah. How much that cost you for insurance? Premium uh, go up? What happened? Well, it just it's just recent, so we'll uh, probably get the uh, hit next year. So you're going to find <laughs> but out. But it was like a $90,000 uh, claim. Wow. Yeah. And this was at a time, this was uh, your biggest project, right? Right. Like 1.8 million? Yeah. And you don't want to upset this customer. He's probably no. a very cool dude. Right. Very powerful. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's good. Yeah. So you took care of that. You ate that lesson. What yeah. was another learning lesson that you went through that was painful? So if anybody was on the Building Better Connections Tour, which is the event we do every September, yeah. they walked on a jetty that we built. Mm -hmm. So there's marine construction companies and there's landscapers. And right. usually they're not crossing over too much but we were asked to build a jetty what is a jetty a jetty is like a pile of stones stack stones that go out into the water like a dock a, a yeah, stone, a stone dock. dock okay but it also blocks the tide and mm -hmm. things like that so this guy had a jetty but had fallen apart over the years and he wanted to go fish on the end of it so the uh the designer asked us to price building the jetty so my equipment operator was like yeah i can do it you know he'd take the excavator out over the jetty and keep building 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 so I priced it at 50 grand. Okay, reasonable? Sounds reasonable. Yeah, okay. So the, the whole landscape we were doing there was a conservation approved project. Mm -hmm. So we started doing the jetty and then all of a sudden conservation shows up and the designer and the homeowner snuck over on us that the jetty wasn't part of the conservation plan. Ah. We didn't know that, we just thought all the work was approved. Right. So they issued a stop order, so we stopped. Now they had to go back and get approval six months later they got approval, but with the condition that we don't bring in any big boulders because we were going to bring in big boulders to line the outside of the walls. Yeah, just to protect the waves. Right. Yeah. So we said, okay, that was our mistake right there. We should have not, we should have said it can't be done. Mm -hmm. Well, going back, I should have hired a marine construction company and subbed it out. Yeah. But I figured I, we could do it ourselves and I'd make more money because my equipment operator is a salary kind of guy. He doesn't so. cost anything. Right. Yeah. So, um, we rebuild it. Mm -hmm. It looked beautiful. It's on our Instagram account, a YouTube channel. Yeah. People looked at it at the tour, and the first storm that came, bam, wham, fell apart. Really? All we, of them? All of it. We rebuilt it. Next storm came, bam, fell apart again. Uh. So now the guy brought in an engineer and a marine construction company, and now he's going to spend 200000 to build it properly. And I had to refund him the fifty. Ah. Uh. Well, good thing you only charge them fifty. Yeah. Imagine if you charge. I know, them, right? Imagine if you charge them a hundred. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> wow. Sometimes it's good to to say no. Yeah. It's Learn okay. to say no. If it's not in your wheelhouse, say no. Yeah. So that, that I mean that's that's what I've learned along the way is people always ask me, why don't you do pools? Why don't you do pools? I don't. I, I just don't want to get into pools right now because they're the business is fine doing just landscaping, mm -hmm. and you got to a point where it really pushed you to do pools because a lot of the construction you do is with pools and landscaping. Right. But sometimes people here in California, they don't have enough room for pool. Right. You know? So now that you're a professional pool builder, do you do anything else? So last year we had the opportunity to purchase a tennis court maintenance and construction company called mm -hmm. Boston Tennis. So we bought that last July and now that's added to the companies like a subsidiary of Blue Claw. How did Boston Tennis, you know nothing about tennis courts. How'd you do that? Well, I knew nothing about landscaping or pools. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> 
Um, so, no, it was a friend of a friend. Guy's retiring. He'd been in business 50 years, mm -hmm. approached us, looked at the numbers, went through our negotiations, and we decided to buy it because they were doing roughly a million five a year. Mm -hmm. About 70% was maintenance, so it's recurring. So that's clay court maintenance and then what I call cracking paints where you repair the court, new new paint. Um, a lot of pickleball conversions. Pickleball? Yeah. I just started playing pickleball. You play pickleball? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Did you play? I've not. I've never played and I've never seen a game live. But you installed? But I've built many pickleball courts. How much does a pickleball court cost to install besides the concrete? No concrete included. Uh, well, they're asphalt. Yeah. Typically. R really? Yeah. But oh. about 40 grand. I didn't know they're asphalt. I yeah. thought they're all concrete. They're painted asphalt. Huh. 40,000? Yeah. Just for the paint? No, for the court. Oh, for the whole paint thing? Paint job's around 20. Okay, got it. That's crazy. Yeah. So the maintenance, how much is a maintenance contract for a uh, tennis court? So a clay court, we go in and um, take up the old layer that was compacted from the winter, put in new hartrue, which is a synthetic clay, you know, the tape lines. Mm -hmm. We have to put down the new lines, mm -hmm. hang the net. That's about five grand per c Every court. year? Every year. So we have... Uh, golf clubs, tennis clubs, uh, yacht clubs that have and people's clay homes courts too. and people's homes and people that usually have a tennis court in their home. Yeah, they're balling. They're not touching it. They don't care. They <laughs> want it all done for them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we do about three months of clay court maintenance. Mm -hmm. Then when the weather gets warm, like now, we start doing crack and paint repairs, mm -hmm. conversions to pickleball court, and then we install new asphalt courts and new clay courts. Wow, that's awesome. And so you bought the business. Yes. It was doing one and a half mil. Yep. And what did you buy the business for? How much? Uh, 285000 Crazy. Was, yeah, we used the SBA loan to buy it. Wow. That was, that's a good deal. That was a good deal. I think that's a great offer, yeah. 285. Yeah. So then uh, what is it doing now? And do you like the business? I love the business. Yeah. Um, let me explain it this way. There's probably 1,000 landscapers in Eastern Mass. There's mm -hmm. only four sport court builders. Wow. So you're pretty much like a monopoly. Yeah, monopoly. Wow. And... Um, the it's not as difficult as pools or thi things like that and we kept all the staff that had been with the company previously some mm -hmm. of the, one guy has been there 50 years some 30 years so they know they really know what they're doing and does, is it similar to seal coating yeah there are seal coating companies that dabble in quartz yeah i yeah. think it's just putting goo everywhere yeah it's painting. acrylic paint yeah. yeah that's cool yeah so you like the business i love it and then uh what do you think it's going to do this year? How much in sales? So the old the old owner, you know, he was Yellow Pages and Notepad. He wasn't technology at no all. No computer. No. Wow. So he was um, he would turn down a lot of leads. People would call and he'd just say, ah, I'm too busy, call someone else. <laughs> so I have a, a sales estimating person, and we take every lead, we process proposals, and so as a result, we're landing a backlog of projects. Mm -hmm. um, so. We're, we bought new trucks for the company. We're starting to expand the staff. I hired, I hired a company from South Carolina that does sport courts to come mm -hmm. up and help with the backlog. Yeah. And I think we're going to do over $2 million the first year. Wow. Yeah. And just by you implementing technology yep. and buying a couple of trucks. Exactly. That's amazing. Uh, now that you're a pool professional, landscape professional, and now added new skill to the toolbox, you're a tennis court Mm -hmm. professional also what 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 does the revenue do for all those businesses right and so they're, they're interrelated both in the fact that they can share customers but also we share overhead mm -hmm. so every company doesn't have to have its own office staff its own rents so don't you know certain things yes but it's definitely a co what we call economy of scale mm -hmm. so the three companies combined are going to be over 10 million in sales this year um, and our maintenance and landscaping is scaling rapidly so it's it's a symbiotic thing because now landscape projects that the tennis court company would turn away, they can send to Blue Claw, and then Blue Claw will have a client that wants a pickleball court, and they can you know so it's now it's starting to. You built cross. a one stop shop. Exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. And even maintenance too. Right. Construction, pool building, pickleball maintenance. What don't you do? Well, next is going to be pool maintenance. Pool maintenance. So next year we're going to have pool maintenance crew. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, re recurring revenue is a big deal. Yes. Big deal. Because yep. it just keeps on coming. And then when times get tough, people still need to get their lawns cut, right. pool maintenance, all that. Yep. Based on all those things, what do you think you're going to do in sales this year? We are projecting over $10 million combined Whoa. between landscaping, pools, and tennis courts. Which which one holds the most amount of revenue? The landscaping? Obviously landscaping. Yeah. yeah. Prior to starting the pool company, we did $5 million. Mm -hmm. um, in 2022 mm -hmm. in just in landscaping and then with the pool company and the tennis court company a little over five and the maintenance has grown since the we did five mm -hmm. we'll probably be ten and a half eleven million so what do you think landscaping's f about five million 
pool is what two three mil uh, i would say landscaping is six mm -hmm. pools are probably two and a half and tennis courts two I, my question is how do you find the time to do all this because a lot of people watching right now they're like dude how does someone even do something like this i'm not i'm here i'm not doing it yeah right so i have people in places mm -hmm. i have accounting office i have managers project managers maintenance manager um i'm in touch with them so mm -hmm. i get i ask for pictures you know same thing you do yeah um when i'm there i'm driving relationships with the customers with the architects mm -hmm. i'm managing the accounting but everything's online now that way so as long as you have those systems set up you can dip in dip out mm -hmm. you know that's that's so basically you just got to be a master delegator yes you got to yeah. learn how to trust people that's probably one of my biggest strengths and it comes from the fact that I wasn't doing the work initially. Mm -hmm. So I w had to let them go, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But also we have three different locations we work. So if I go to Nantucket for the day, the people in the Cape don't see me that day. They just know Ian's in Nantucket. If mm -hmm. I go work at Boston Tennis, no one in Nantucket or the Cape sees me. Mm -hmm. So they're used to not seeing me certain days of the week. So if I go to California, they don't know if I'm on Nantucket or the Cape. Right. They just know how they'll see me when I see me. That makes sense. So what, what, what was the biggest change was it the office was it the staff in the field managers what got you the next level uh i think it was like steps yeah it wasn't just one so the first one was landing the architects that mm -hmm. had the premier clients yeah right so you can't showcase your crew's talent if you're just doing small jobs that are aesthetically not wonderful yeah you know what i mean if someone gives you a wonderful project and you have skilled craftsmen it's going to look amazing mm -hmm. so that platformed us to to grow that company. The construction that we're doing fed maintenance mm -hmm. because if we install a half a million dollar landscape, that's going to be a $30,000, $40,000 maintenance account. Mm -hmm. And if I don't maintain it, it's going to my competitor. Right. Um, the pools came with landscape construction, but now people are calling the pool company for pools and then that's feeding Blue Claw. Mm -hmm. So it, they feed each other. Yeah. And then Tennis Court, that was a standalone company, but it's now becoming integrated part of the deal yeah that's awesome my my thing the biggest thing that got me to the next level was office right once i figured out that i need someone helping me answering emails phone calls all the things that you just don't have time to do when it comes to doing all that stuff plus managing the field right and it seemed like for you it was the same thing once well, you figure out your office the first building better connections i remember when you announced your plan yeah because you basically said for a while you were just going to keep applewood small yeah i was just i was happy with <laughs> just me and the guys in the right. field and then you said you know what yeah. you guys inspire me because i see you with a team of people you with a team of people yeah. and i want a team of people yeah i remember that moment yeah, that yeah. was before you did it yeah and then from there you went out and you put the things in place and so that's working on the business. You know, mm -hmm. we can all go out and sell a job and manage a job, but if you're not thinking and dreaming ahead to the next step, mm -hmm. you're not going to get there. You're just going to keep being in the same situation. Yeah. And to be honest, looking back, my my life was the reason I was happy making like two and a half, three million dollars mm -hmm. all by myself is because my life was so much better than it was two, three, four years ago. Right. But I just couldn't see what was possible. And then I came and saw your operation. And I was like, damn. I got to step it up. Right. And that's when I found the whole staff, office staff, and everything changed. And yes, you have to pay them a lot of money, right. the office staff, but your quality of life improves so much. Right. Because you're not burnt out. Correct. Because the first time you left, were you burnt out? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Are you burnt out now? No, not at all. <laughs> Seems like you're chilling. <laughs> I couldn't trust anyone in the office. I wanted to do all the accounting. Exactly. Right? So yeah. you, no. have, you have to let it go. Yeah. Based on all those things, how did we? How did you even find me? How did I find you? What happened? So when I first started like having success in my small company, mm -hmm. I would share it with my wife and my three best friends, and three or four times in a row, they would get tired of hearing it, kind of tune me out. But the first time, they were probably very excited. Yeah, no, they were. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I remember before I even landed a project, my wife said to me, when are you going to sell a job? Mm -hmm. She was like waiting for me to sell a job, and I'm just like, relax. <laughs> so I tease her about that now. Yeah. But... So I'm on YouTube yeah. and I saw you, uh, one of your videos like 350,000 in 30 days. Yeah. And then I saw the guys with you in Miami mm -hmm. and it was like, if you want to join a group of like minded, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. so I'm like, you know what? I don't want partners in my company, but I need to vent like what I'm going through. So yeah. I just took on a lark, joined Goat Gang yeah. and I started posting Shimo mm -hmm. first project. That was a big deal. Yeah. I remember watching your videos and I was like, how is he doing that? Because 
I was doing jobs, but I wasn't doing jobs that big. Right. So I was actually inspired and impressed. So the first time we met is we went to uh, Maryland to visit one of the members in Goking for his birthday. Yeah. And that's when I met you. Exactly. And you told me all about crabs. Right. And then now I understood <laughs> why you named your company Blue Claw. There you go. Yeah. So that was that was pretty cool. And uh, Ian is very actually very impressive because he's one of the most active people in Goking. And the most. The most. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm, I'm I'd say number one. Okay. Number yeah. Two. Number two. <laughs> I'll let you have that. <laughs> and then the then there's other people underneath, but it seems like every single month you're just uh, posting videos, answering questions, helping the other guys, right. and you still have time to do a ten million dollar business. Yeah. A lot of people what they say is oh, I don't have time to be on social media. Right. Well, if you don't make time, you don't get time. And eventually you figured out how you can manage your time and scale your business. And now you're actually helping people do their right. accounting. So you, you just helped the guy up north. You went yep. to visit him yep. uh, like an hour away and you saw his whole operations. Yep. You pretty much dove right in. Yep. What did you see? What kind of mistakes was he making? Well, I saw things like operational issues, like in terms of if you want to be efficient, you got to give your employees the right tools and mm -hmm. things like that. So replacing pickup trucks with dump trucks is one thing I would recommend right sizing equipment so mm -hmm. if you're doing hardscapes you need a machine that can unload a pallet of pavers which yeah. would in a cat world is a minimum 259, 259 yeah. right but then in california a lot of the sites are very very small so you can't even get a um, machine like that sometimes mm -hmm. on the site so where um he had a 239 can't lift up pavers but it's too big to get in backyards mm -hmm. so the thing was sitting for a while so we take a look at people's operations, see if there's efficiencies from things that I've learned that I can help them with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm known for accounting, so we dig into the QuickBooks and do the chart of accounts mm -hmm. and make sure that they're estimating properly, that he was a graduate of Know Your Numbers, which mm -hmm. is the workshops that I've been doing. Mm -hmm. And so I helped him polish off his Know Your Numbers, set his QuickBooks up, set his budget up, make sure that he's estimating to those numbers. Mm -hmm. And we found that um, some of the legacy accounts were not priced that way. So if you want to be successful, you have to know what you need to charge and you have to enforce or provide information so your crews can succeed within those budgets mm -hmm. because the whole name of the game is lining up billable hours with estimated hours. If yeah. you do that, this is a wildly successful um, industry, industry for anybody, but yeah. most people don't do that because they're giving flat price quotes and then employee hours or whatever they are. Yeah, and wh what, was, what was he doing, construction maintenance? Uh, he had one construction company, one maintenance company. Which one was doing better than the other? Uh, I would say the construction probably was doing better yeah. overall. And maintenance was not doing good. What, what was some of the mistakes that he was making in maintenance? Uh, I think it was pricing the jobs initially. Um, really? and it, he explained in his area that it's very competitive with some of the big national companies. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you have to target a different audience, more of the high-end residential, mm -hmm. um, or just don't take them. You'd right. be better off not taking them. Yeah, because if you're going to lose money on a maintenance account, why even do it? Right. You know? And a lot of people, they want to know, how do you get jobs? How do you get jobs? What's one of the ways that you have done to get a lot of the work? So we build relationships with landscape architects, designers, yep. and then certain select home builders, mm -hmm. the custom builders. And so when we become their preferred go-to contractor, they send us all their projects. Mm -hmm. We don't get them all, but at least we get an opportunity to price them all. Yeah. What's your closing rate? People always probably want to know. What's your closing rate? It's probably between 35 and 45 percent. Okay. Yeah. For for uh, maintenance or construction? For construction, for and construction. that's someone we have a relationship with. Right. So I don't. I feel like if you're over 50 percent, you're probably too too low. Because I get I get referrals from a designer here in the Bay Area that's very well known, Matt Daly, mm -hmm. and some of the jobs I close, some of them I don't. Right. And I'm like I'm like man, dude, because I know how much it's going to cost. Right. How is this guy going to do it for a hundred thousand dollars less? Right. I don't know. I still don't know. And it used to bother me when I didn't get a job because I feel like I could envision us doing every project. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you have a production capacity and uh, you just want to fill that mm -hmm. and y with the highest price you can get. Mm -hmm. So you don't want those jobs. But if you're trying to grow, and that's how we've grown, is we don't, we haven't turned down any project we rewarded. So right. if we didn't have the bandwidth to do it, we would basically split a crew into two and then start another crew mm -hmm. and that's how we kind of kept growing the company mm -hmm. and then how many guys on a crew do you have typically in construction is between three and four three and four and how long did, would a uh let's say four hundred thousand dollar job take three and four guys uh probably about three or four months yeah yeah 120 days yeah um yeah that's that's a long time that's a lot of managing do you go to job sites quite every day not every day, not every day. and it's my it's the most fun thing i like to do 
job and, yeah and, <laughs> and we've gotten so big that yeah. i'm it's just, i guess it's a badge of honor but it's also kind of embarrassing sometimes i see where we're at on our projects when a new video comes on our social media really yeah and i go oh I they're doing the wall that's cool that's awesome because i haven't been there for a month mm -hmm. and you not being there uh do mistakes still happen on the job sites because a lot of people on social media they post all the good stuff right and they're like we're the best company yada yada but i go through mistakes all the time mm -hmm. and i still I'm very meticulous about paying attention. I, I would say I have really good employees, mm -hmm. but my team is awesome, but we still make mistakes. How often do you guys make mistakes on your jobs? Uh, I would say often. often. Um, and so we and know your numbers, we budget for it. We mm -hmm. have flub factors and all that kind of stuff, contingencies, but you have to know that this is a moving parts business. Right. You have weather, you have suppliers, you have employee mistakes, you mm -hmm. have miscommunication, you have equipment breakdowns. So rather than saying when the sky is falling, we all have those employees like, oh, it's so terrible. It's yeah. Like, but this, we know the trailer f is going to have a flat tire. Right. So it's deal with it and move on, mm -hmm. you know. So you try not to have them. Sure. You try to implement things that prevent them. Um, but I always turn the negative into a positive with the client mm -hmm. because when there's an issue, I just take care of it without blinking. Right. No problem. We'll come over. You wanted that round. We'll make it round. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll sometimes I'll even say, Listen, no company is going to do everything perfect, but it's it shows more about you as a company how you respond to a situation mm -hmm. than to just assume nothing is ever going to go wrong. Right. You know. That's true. So and I use it as a marketing. So I tell people all the time that one of the best values of the Goat Gang is that you live vicariously through your company and your mistakes. Mm -hmm. You don't a post. Lot. Yeah, you don't post like I'm the greatest of all right. time. Applewood's perfect. Yeah. You'll share what's going on on a daily basis so that the younger guys can follow that learn from it and mm -hmm. avoid them yes that's huge because like one of the mistakes i did was uh having the sub do the incorrect uh nail pattern on the roof mm -hmm. and that cost me probably fifteen twenty thousand dollars in things that could have been avoided right and i just get on there and post a video this is what you not not to do right. do not do this make right. sure you don't do this and you do this all the time too yeah you you get on there and, and you just share exactly what not to do sometimes that's more important than what to do right you know or um, situations that you've helped me with too is like uh, not being afraid to pay the top artisans real money. Mm -hmm. You know, because as a numbers guy, I would struggle like, oh, I got to keep my crew wage at this. So when I heard you post that video about, you know, just pay them, just pay them. If they're, if they're going to do the quality work, it's mm -hmm. like advertising for you. You need it. So I pay, my, I think my masons probably owe you a commission on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was, I, it gave me the confidence to just pay them. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, if we don't do top level masonry, we don't have any of those architect customers. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that has helped me tremendously. And then um, just the um, back and forth with all the members mm -hmm. too, because it's not just about you preaching or me preaching. It's about each other, you know, camaraderie in the goat gang, like right. with online, but also at events. Mm -hmm. Like I came to San Jose for uh, Ditch Witch a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Guys I had never met. Hey, it's Ian. Ian's here. Yeah. Hey, man, I watched your video. You helped yeah. me out. And I'm yeah. like, who are you again? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So people, are, even if they don't comment, are still watching. Right. Everyone's watching. Yeah. And the more people you can get around, just like when you first started in the 90s, you went to these seminars. Now these seminars are online. Yes. It's just literally you, you, you link in. And if someone lives in Massachusetts, Boston, you're there. There's also a bunch of people in Goking that are right. there. People that are in Texas. It's all over the country. So there's a lot of people, a lot of good uh, network to get in, and everything can change right. if you just allow it to change. You know. So ninety-seven dollars a month, it's like the best value. I mean, come on, yeah. of all time. And I spent a, over a hundred thousand dollars on in the nineties. In the nineties, yeah. which is probably t double that now, yeah, sure. on consultants. And had I had this type of a tool, where it's a thousand people and mm -hmm. all their experiences. And people that you can message and ask question advice mm. get on the phone with people it's it's i mean the value is ridiculous and how many people have dro drove to your job site that you've never met you're like hey uh, i live by you can i come see i had dozens in the yeah. first few years right. and then we sh we funneled them now to the events mm -hmm. and um all the time i'm getting messages from people right because it's really inspiring because if you can see a guy doing it then you like well i can do it Right. And that's the whole point. So that's the, the tour that you went on uh, in Cape Cod and Nantucket. Building better connections, that's, it's, I call it landscape porn for the mm -hmm. first two days. Because mm -hmm. I'm dragging you around to sites and you're seeing these $800,000 projects, yeah. intricate designs. So like, okay, this is possible. 
Mm -hmm. This, all this is possible if you do follow this. Mm -hmm. And then the third day is the learning about how you can implement that in your company. Because mm -hmm. if you can't visualize it, it, you're just listening to a lecture, it may not stick. But right. once you visualize it, then you meet the people that gave you those projects. Now you yeah. can make it a reality. And once you're in, like we give you actual tools about how to do contracts, how to bid, how to price, things not to do, things to do, how to uh, handle employees. Like there's just so many videos that you've posted, I've posted, right. tons of other people have posted that are very educational and it's just like step by step on how to do this. Yeah, and now if I have a problem that I don't know the answer to, I just throw it on the go gang, like my son's window cleaning. I don't know if mm -hmm. you saw the other I day. Did. Hey, who can help? I don't do digital marketing because we, we do the architects. Mm -hmm. So I threw it on there. How can I get digital leads from my son's window cleaning company? Had 20 something replies in the mm -hmm. first six hours. Did you get it resolved? Absolutely. Wow, I didn't even know that. <laughs> That's cool. And um, one, of the, one of the coolest things that we're gonna do is September 28th to 30th, you're gonna hold an event called right. Building Better Connections, BBC. <laughs> <laughs> And we're all gonna go there, a bunch of us, we're gonna fly in and you're gonna take us on a whole two, three day tour? Two day tour and two then a learning tour, conference. Two day tour of job sites of the ones that you have actively and also the ones that you had previously completed. completed. And uh, it's cool to see active job sites, but like the completed work is what really struck me, like especially the $1.8 million job. Right. I was walking, I was like, holy moly, how does this guy even afford to even have a house like this? Yeah. Like it just opens your mind up. Not only he did the job, but how did he? How did the homeowner afford this? Right. That's crazy. Right. The amount of uh, expansion. So, can you touch a little bit about the the building better connections? Yes. So Thursday the twenty eighth, we go on a boat, high speed ferry over to Nantucket Island, mm -hmm. billionaires playground, mm -hmm. and we tour, like you said, our current job sites. You can meet the crew, see how the trailers set up. We're going to do a pool feature this time on building pools because I know a lot of people are curious about getting into that fly then we have charter planes we fly back in the evening to the cape friday we're going to tour the boston tennis facilities see how that works because everybody's having those type of projects in mm -hmm. their area pickleball's huge they may be interested in getting into that line of work um, we have an office and facility tour at blue claw where you meet all the employees and they can explain how they do their job and we can explain the office yeah. flow um, and then how big is your office we bought a 4,500 square foot building last October. Is it full? It's full. And then we're going to be there. We're going to be there. To touring everything. Yes. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, and then Blue Claws projects on the Cape, mm -hmm. current and um, completed. And then Saturday is where we have a conference in a hotel, learning opportunity. We bring in architects, designers. Uh, Peter Cook will be there, people that work with architects and designers. Um, I explain how I did it. Mm -hmm. And that gives people an opportunity to ask questions to these designers that they probably couldn't get away with in their home market. Because right. if they went and asked basic questions, they look like, oh, you don't know anything, I'm not gonna hire you. Yeah. But this is a safe zone where they can ask whatever they want and see if they can take that technique and apply it to their business when they get back home. And if you go to your competitor and ask them questions, they're not gonna share information no. with you. Because a lot of people have this very old way school of thinking, if you help your competitor, then he's gonna do better than you right. in the long run. But we don't care. The more people we can help, the better it is because it just raises the industry, and makes everything better. Yeah. And that's the cool thing. Like you'll meet designers, architects, people that have been in the game for 20, 30, 40 years yeah. and just learn a ton. So September 28th. So, so September 28th to the 30th will be in the East Coast, Massachusetts, Nantucket, Cape Cod. Yeah. And we're going to see all your job sites. Blueclawgroup.com is where we have a video of last year's event and mm -hmm. information about this year. And I even posted a YouTube video about it. Yes, you I did. did two years ago yep. so i'll link that in here too so really appreciate you coming out uh if you guys want to get in contact with ian it's going to be in the description and if you like these types of videos comment below who you want me to bring on and we'll make it happen later